Okay, um, our topic today is miracles, obviously, and I want to begin with uh, a video clip. Hopefully it won't take too long. Um, this is Inherit the Wind. Have any of you seen this or heard of it? Robbie? You, you don't know why you've seen it? Did you see it in high school or something? Okay, that is not surprising. In fact, um, in 1994, the National Center for History in Schools published instructional standards as a means to educate high school students about changing values during the 1920s. It recommended that teachers use selections from the Scopes trial or excerpts from Inherit the Wind to explain how the views of William Jennings Bryan differed from those of Clarence Darrell. So it, it has actually been recommended by the National Center for History in Schools to show as a, a, a historical piece. The problem is this is pure Hollywood. Okay, There are huge historical misrepresentations in this movie. Have you all heard of the Scopes trial? So, okay, so you basically know what was going on there. Well, this is the dramatic presentation, Hollywood version of it. Okay, and uh, it's an interesting study. There's been a number of articles and things written critiquing Inherit the Wind historically. That's an interesting study in itself. Um, that's not our purpose today. That's not why I'm looking at this, to critique it historically, as fun as that is. Um, I want to just show this particular clip to, to show how the supernatural or people who believe in miracles or the miracles of the Bible are presented by Hollywood and in our contemporary culture. It's a very uh, vivid example of how miracles are viewed in culture. So um, basically, we're going to jump in at, at one point. The defense lawyer, Clarence Darrow, the names have been changed, is is uh, in the movie that I'm going to show you. He's wrestling how to respond. He's been really upset because they've outlawed all use of scientific witnesses and, and this kind of thing. So he, he's wondering what his next step should be in this trial. Okay. Now, what is... What is the... Uh, rather large irony about all of this. Fast, this was in the 20s, okay? And, and again, the historicity of this is badly skewed by the movie. Okay, so granted. But fast forward to the present. What is the irony here? It's kind of like reverse discrimination. Now, before it was only the Bible could be taught as the truth. And no evolution. Now it's the reverse, where it's only evolution can be done, and everything else is expelled. Expelled, right. That's exactly right. That's a situation we find ourselves where, you know, again, this is a Hollywood production, but his, his point here was, you know, free thought, where, you know, the mind, we should have free inquiry, and there's people who want to outlaw that and just preserve the Bible. Now it's exactly a reverse, right? People w want to only have students be able to learn about Darwinism. And everything else is, is unwelcome. So it's a, it's a very interesting shift that is, has taken, taken place. This movie, by the way, it was originally a play, and then the movie was made in the... The initial movie was 50s or maybe 60s, and then it was reissued with different actors, same script, in the, in the 90s. And as I read to you, the uh, history, what is it called? The National Center for History and Schools 
recommends this to teach accurate history, which is a sad commentary on, on uh, education. But nevertheless, um, uh, you should have got a handout with the slides. Uh, there'll be a few definitions that I wanted to save you from having to write down. But I think we should approach this, the, the issue of miracles, when we're dealing with questions related to miracles, I think the way we need to treat this is at the worldview level um, because it really is a worldview issue. Now, Dawkins says the virgin birth, the resurrection, the raising of Lazarus, even the Old Testament miracles all are freely used for religious propaganda. And they are very effective with an audience of unsophisticates and children. Every one of these miracles amounts to a violation of the normal running of the natural world. Response. Chris. It's a perfect definition of a miracle in the last sentence. Okay. Um, yes, although violation might be a bit strong. But right, it is something that out stands outside of the natural world. Any other comments? John? Effective audience of unsophisticated yeah. children. Right. That's, that's what he is trying to... Um, trying to present cr Christianity, religion, as, as, as just totally uh, throw, check your brain at the door, okay? Against intellectual uh, reason or thought, it's just a bunch of superstition. That's all miracles are. Jeremy? That's a strong intellectual fallacy. You're right. Why? Well, because he's trying to make us look dumb, so our argument looks dumb, too. Okay. So... Um, what else would you say in response then to show that uh, the concept of miracle is not just a, you know, a childhood kind of uh, fairy tale? How would you argue in response to Dawkins? Is it, isn't it, is it rational to believe in miracles? Jeremy? That one guy said... Um, it's rational to believe in things you think can happen. Um, Reform epistemology, is that what it was? Okay, <laughs> right. Um, okay, without evidence, unless there can be defeaters, I think he would say, well, there's plenty of defeaters that Darwinian evolution produces or something like that. Chris? Well, it comes from the premise that there is no God. That's his first presupposition. Okay. It's wrong because he assumes there is no God in order to make that claim. But if there is a God, miracles are completely acceptable. There is nothing wrong with that. Okay. So, from his worldview, miracles do appear like fairy tales. Okay. So, let's chart it out here. Here's, here's his worldview. Nature is all there is. There's no, there is no outside force that can intervene in nature. The physical, the material is all there is. So, of course, miracles, which by definition are outside of the realm of nature, therefore appear, appear like uh, children's stories. Um, However, is that the only possible worldview? The objection to miracles is ultimately a worldview issue. Um, and so what we are up against in this issue is naturalism versus supernaturalism. And I think a very r rational, logical way to respond to this is given, for example, by William Lane Craig. But if there is a creator who designed and brought the universe into being, 
who sustains its existence moment by moment, who is responsible for the very natural laws that govern the physical world, then certainly it's rational to believe that the miraculous is possible. Jonathan? Um, I think C.S. Lewis had an interesting example that was a clock maker. Okay. If, a clock, if, a, if he makes a clock, you could be at any time and he could change anything in it since he made it. Okay, he's the designer. Okay, so he can o- overrule. Right. Now, so that's a good thing to say. Is there anything else you would want to say to a materialist who believes that nature is all there is? Chris? How do you explain the genocide of Rwanda? Okay. The spirit, I mean, these are madmen running around killing, killing, killing their neighbors. For example, just reading about it. How in the world do you explain without a supernatural? Uh, are there a whole 7, 10 million crazy people? So you're saying demonic forces did it? or? Yeah, you, I argue for the demonic. Okay. Uh huh. They might say, well, that was just uh, social Darwinism. <laughs> Those argue that it's religion that causes people to suffer. Yeah. I don't know if that is. Okay. Well, yeah, you could point to different things. For example, the naturalists believe some, some miraculous things, some pretty miraculous things. Yeah, okay. According to Stephen Hawking, almost everyone now, this is a quote from Hawking, almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Okay. But what does that mean? Um, The Big Bang theorists, that explains how the universe got here, but what caused the Big Bang? You really ultimately have to believe that the universe came from nothing by nothing. Okay, so nothing then resulted in something. That seems like a logical fallacy, doesn't it? Uh, You have to have some faith Strong faith to believe that. That seems pretty miraculous. So, on the other hand, we would want to argue the Christian explanation is actually more rational than the materialistic uh, explanation of the universe. Now, there's obviously a lot of complexity. You can go into a lot of science and, and that kind of thing. And... I refer you to the literature for that. But let me just give you one um, example to highlight this, this fact, this contrast between the materialistic worldview and the Christian worldview. There's a British physicist by the name of uh, P.C.W. Davies. And he has concluded that the odds against the initial conditions which are necessary and suitable for the formation of stars and stars are apparently necessary for planets and thus life okay the the odds against the conditions being suitable for that are according to his calculations or some scientific formula a one followed by at least a thousand billion billion zeros. That's a big number. The odds against the conditions being favorable for this kind of situation. Okay, so you can believe that that happened just somehow miraculously, or I would suggest a more satisfying and perhaps more rational explanation is to believe in a personal God, all-powerful designer who intervenes, who creates, and who is able to, to uh, sustain life and interact with the world that he has created. So, 
I think this is a very important point because recognizing that the question of miracles is ultimately a worldview <laughs> issue allows you to interact with someone about this question, even if you don't have all the evidential facts in your head, right? You can, you can argue at the worldview level, which I think is, is really what the issue is. Okay, now let's go on to defining miracles. Before you look at your handout, and I know all of a sudden now you're all tempted to do that, right? See the power of sin and nature and the law. Um, how would you define a miracle? Nelson sort of gave us a definition. What is a miracle? Supernatural. Okay. Anything outside the natural realm? Okay. Something that goes against the laws of nature. <clears throat> okay. Like a pen falling, pencil falling. That's the law of nature. Yeah, so it was su- suspended in midair, not by a string. <laughs> <laughs> that would be right. I think miracles normally have a positive connotation, like raising something from the dead. Okay. Good thing. Okay. Okay, we'll look at that question uh, because that's an interesting one. Um, here's Lewis's definition and interference with nature by supernatural power. Um, another one, an, an event in which God temporarily makes an exception to the natural order of things to show that God is acting. So this, this definition brings in a purpose in order to show that God is acting. Okay, Craig, a miracle is an event which is not producible by the natural causes that are operative at the time and place that the event occurs. So in all all these definitions, you see the concept of supra nature in connection with with, uh, miracles. Okay, so that's the concept of, or the definition of miracle. Now, you can understand the naturalist or the materialist's problem here because he doesn't believe there's anything outside of nature. This is a closed universe. There's no, nothing pointing outside. There's nothing outside pointing in or, or able to work on nature because nature is all there is. So... Um, how could you then challenge this embedded, this, this, this firmly held presupposition that nature is all there is? Well, you remember the way you challenge atheism? We've mentioned this a, a couple of times. You suggest that unless you're omniscient, you have to at least entertain the possibility that there might be something beyond nature that you are not aware of. Okay, so you can't be you can't be a hard and fast naturalist or materialist unless you're omniscient. Now, another question that that comes up here is does natural law rule out the possibility of miracles? Does natural law rule out the possibility of miracles? What would you say? I'd say the the reverse actually makes miracles possible because without the natural laws, there would be nothing for miracles to go against. Okay. Yeah, to go against. Okay. To show they can be broken. What do nat? Yeah. Okay. So, what do natural laws actually do? Dealt with this a little bit, Nelson. What does another way to put it? What does science describe? Norm. What normally takes place, right? The law of gravity. Um, but that does not rule out the possibility of a miracle. Okay, it simply describes what normally takes place. Now, sometimes, sometimes we use the term miracle rather loosely, right? We say, uh, 
um, the the uh, what? Yeah. Okay. Or the 1980 U.S. hockey team beating the Soviets. Miracle on ice. Um, it's a miracle. All these leaves are just randomly falling. <laughs> um, or the birth of a baby. We say it's, it's a miracle. Well, actually, no, there's a natural explanation for a birth of a baby. Now, virgin birth. Now, obviously, that is a miracle because you cannot have a natural explanation for a virgin birth. Uh, there is an explanation, but it's not a natural explanation. So it's very important to understand that miracles don't contradict science, and I think this, Nelson was bringing this out. They simply lie outside the scope of science, which by definition, again, deals with the natural realm. That's a very important thing to, because I think a lot of guys like uh, Dawkins use this argument as almost like a trump card to be so self-evident. But you have to clarify the scope of science and what we're dealing with with uh, the supernatural, miracles. Now, let's take an example of an apple tree, right? The law of gravity would say that apple falls to the ground, it's the normal thing to expect. But let's say someone standing beside the apple tree holds out his hand, catches, catches the apple before it falls to the ground. Well, that's simply intervening into what would normally take place given the law of gravity. And in a sense, that's what happens with a miracle. You have outside intervention overruling certain natural, uh, what you would naturally expect to happen. And that's essentially, again, what God does. Okay, now let's, let's move to the, the issue of miracle, miracles in Scripture. We talked about this being a, a worldview issue. Well, in the biblical worldview, miracles are to be expected. It would be very strange if we didn't see miracles because God is the creator and he is active in the world he's made. He's omnipotent. He's able to accomplish miracles. So, for example, you have a text like Mark 10, 27. With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Jeremiah 32, 10. Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power, by your art outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Okay, so from a biblical worldview, we need to expect miracles. I'm giving you this chart to come back to something that Jeremy suggested, that miracles are... We usually think of miracles as a positive thing. However, this chart is designed to illustrate the Christian or biblical worldview. And in the biblical worldview, here is the natural realm. There is a, there is a realm outside the natural realm we call the supernatural. And here you have good angels. And you have Satan and fallen angels, demons. And this realm is able to enter and interact with the natural realm. And so I bring this up because it's important not to assume that every miracle is necessarily a good thing. Can you think of any biblical examples where there are miracles that were not necessarily good? Okay, demon possession. Okay, false prophets or prophets inspired by a lying spirit or something like that. When Pharaoh's magicians were doing the same type of thing as Moses. Yes, that is probably the, the, the most dramatic example. Exodus 7, 
verse 11, Exodus 7, 11 and 22, they replicate the miracles done by, uh, through Moses by God. Now, God stands outside both realms and can intervene. Okay. Uh, God even does miracles that we would see as something negative, or like the people, for the people that it happened to, right? Like the family that got eaten up by the, by the earth. Okay. Abraham's time. So his judgment. He, he intervenes in the natural realm to exer- exercise judgment. Yeah. Now, that's an interesting point because... <clears throat> sometimes these miracles <laughs> <laughs> have uh, a natural explanation, but they're, they, are, they are sent from God. Like the flood, you could explain that there's just a lot of rain, right? We still have floods. But it was clearly, the biblical explanation is God sent this flood and God orchestrated the event so it would get really, really, really high. Well, one interesting thing is that miracles never seem to go and use material that is not available to it. Like, there's no, I can think of any new creation or anything. God did creation and he finished it and he did it. And he's not like, in order to do something, he's not creating something that we've never seen before or God works within nature to do to do miracles. Yeah. And Satan as well. The burning bush. Yeah. Some would argue virgin birth though. But he's using a woman to bring forth a child. Yeah, but it he, he's nevertheless still used the woman's natural gestation there was a womb involved and that kind of thing. The conception was a miraculous thing. But the development and and the product was a real human being. Now, let's think about, we're running out of time here, so let's move on. Let's think about the miracles of Jesus. And here's, uh, this little section I'm going to talk about now is sort of an example of how an evidentialist would, would talk about the miracles of Jesus. Okay, this is probably not the way a presuppositionalist would talk about it. By the way... Um, there's a new documentary out called Collision, which is a debate between Douglas Wilson and Christopher Hitchens. Douglas Wilson is the Christian. Now, the reason I bring this up is because Douglas Wilson is arguing consistently from a presuppositional point of view. So if you want an example of how that works, you can you can look at that. Now, it's a little frustrating because... It jumps around a lot. It's not a sustained debate back and forth. The producer thought to sustain interest, you had to jump all over the place. So it's a little irritating that way. But if you want an example of uh, how a presuppositionalist would argue, that would be an example. Now, so here's an evidential approach to the miracles of Jesus. Uh, Jesus, you would present, did they really happen? That's a question that is raised. So, a lot of liberals will say these miracles are just myths that the church attributed to Jesus. Okay, but you have Jesus as a miracle worker is well attested. You have um, multiple early attestation. Okay, so internal and external. Gospels, all four gospels, and some of the gospels are written within a generation of Jesus' life and ministry by eyewitnesses. You have, uh, outside the Gospels, the Book of Acts attests to Jesus' miracle work. You have external attestations. So, for example, uh, Josephus, Talmud, which is Jewish literature. You have, everyone is united that Jesus did signs, miracles, wonders. Okay, secondly... Jesus claimed his works were supernatural. Well, why is that important? Well, you know, if your Aunt Tilly claimed to perform some miracle, that'd be one thing that'd be very hard to believe. There's no miracle context. But Jesus claimed to be God, right? And so 
you have a miracle context where Jesus is continually saying, hey, don't just believe me. Believe because I'm doing these works. These works, works authenticate me or my claims of who I am. And then thirdly, very interesting, you have Jesus' opponents admit to his miracles, and this is pervasive throughout the Gospels. Uh, just a few samples uh, where the Pharisees and others will recognize Jesus did a miracle. In fact, you remember, I think it's this one, Matthew 21, they come to him and, and ask about... Um, where he gets the authority to do these miracles, and his response was, you remember, John the Baptist, is he from God or, or not? And he caught them, and they didn't want to answer that. So he says, I'm not going to tell you. So they come to him acknowledging, how to, by what authority? You, are you doing these things from Beelzebub? Demonic influence? Another important uh, element here is understanding in the Bible why miracles take place, the purpose of biblical miracles. What would you say is the purpose of biblical miracles often? Jeremy? Glorify God. Okay. John 9, certainly. Healing of the blind man. Okay. To authenticate the word of the Lord often. Aaron? Uh, Jesus, when the disciples of John come to him, it's to show that he's the Christ because... Yes. Referring back to the Old Testament. That's Matthew 11, right. That's, that's, a, that's a good point. To authenticate Jesus' claim to be the Messiah. Nelson? You would also do it for like teaching and stuff in the New Testament. A lot of times there is some kind of teaching that ties to his miracle. Okay. Um, bread of life discourse feeds 5,000, and then he has this bread of life discourse. Okay. Now, it's interesting. As you trace miracles in Scripture, it, they're not all the time. It's very interesting that miracles in Scripture tend to cluster around a new stage in salvation history. So, for example, you can think of the Exodus, right? You have the plagues of Egypt. Well, that and then the dramatic, miraculous feeding and feeding from manna from heaven, water from the rock, those kinds of miracles. That was a new stage as the Lord is establishing the nation of Israel as his people. Um, the beginning of the prophetic period, starting with Elijah, Elisha, you see miracles there. The coming of Christ, you see miracles. The birth of the church and the expansion of the gospel, you see initial miracles. But it's interesting, um, that's, that tends to focus on the earlier, once you get to the Later epistles of Paul, you're not seeing, you're not hearing of miracles as much anymore. Okay, so I've given you several references um, on the next page. Let's just look at a couple of them. We got a couple of minutes to do this. Look at Exodus chapter 3. Exodus 3. Now, this was obviously the time when God was raising up Moses to lead the people out of Israel. Exodus 3.19, God says, But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. Okay, and then in chapter 4, verse 1, Then Moses said, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. And uh, so God is commissioning these miracles to authenticate the word, to demonstrate to Pharaoh who he is, to demonstrate to the Israelites that, that he is with Moses. Um, 
Aaron mentioned this text in Matthew. Actually, turn to that one. That's an important one as well. Okay, so John the Baptist comes to Jesus, and he has these questions about, you know, he's in jail. This is not turning out how John expected. John expected the Messiah to come and bring in judgment, right? And so he sends his messengers to Jesus and says, uh, Matthew eleven two. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news preached to them. So that was to authenticate who Jesus was. All those miracles. Um, the same is true in terms of the apostles on some occasions. This 2 Corinthians 12, 12 text is Paul talks about the signs and wonders of a true apostle. In the context of 2 Corinthians, there is talking about false apostles. So how do you know one way you know a true apostle are the signs of an apostle? Let's just look at the last one in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2, 3, and 4. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders with, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Okay, so... Um, a couple of things, just in comment here, why this is important to recognize. First of all, it's not as if, um, you know, miracles are just um, sort of a random thing. There's always a purpose behind them. So it's not just to impress children, okay, or something like that. There, there is a definite purpose to authenticate the work of the Lord or the word of the Lord or the person of Christ. And they often occur at the beginning of a new stage. in his. Now, that is also significant because you have a lot of charlatans today who are claiming to do these miraculous things, but it's a big hoax. So we shouldn't necessarily be ex expect expecting all kinds of mir biblical miracles, the kinds of miracles that happen in the Bible, to take place now. Now, that's not to say God can't do it. I'm not trying to say what God can and can't do. But in terms of understanding the purpose of biblical miracles, it should temper our expectations. Mm -hmm.